Good evening, everyone. Thanks uh, for attending. And this is the first seminar of the new year. So I wish everyone a healthy new year. My name's Steve Peets. I'm chair of Home County Southeast. And just before I introduce our presenter this evening, I have a couple of announcements first. First, thanks for the time taken to attend this evening. And thanks to Ella from the Regions Executive at Ballum, providing all the necessary and much needed technical support for this meeting to go ahead. And really, it's just a reminder that SIBSI regions are in place to support the charitable objectives of the institution and encourage the intellectual welfare of members and improve the understanding of building services. Not only amongst our profession, but society in general, and this is carried out by organising periodic meetings and other activities related to the theme of the built, built environment. So if you have ideas for future meetings or other activities, please, uh, I'll put my contact details in the chat box and please let me know. A couple of housekeeping points. You could have your cameras turned off and your audio on mute. This will help transmission. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. And at the end of the presentation, I'll read the questions to the speaker and ask the speaker to respond. So tonight's seminar is Preventing Corrosion by continuous monitoring. And we have two presenters, Gordon Pringle and Rob Visser. Over to you, Gordon and Robert. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Steve. Thanks everybody for attending and a happy new year to you from Edinburgh. Um, and Rob is over in Germany. Rob will come into the presentation as we go through. So um, without further ado, um, I'll just do a small introduction to myself. Special, HASL, who I'm managing director of, is a firm of specialist uh, HV distributors, distributing a number of brands that you may well be familiar with. The most recent addition to that brand, alongside Rhesus and the Risicor corrosion monitor, has been Schwepp on the Braze plate teeth exchangers. Uh, and one of the processes for that will become apparent and ties in and coordinates with that process as we go through. One of the analogies I often start the presentation with is an analogy that probably Stephen and I are more familiar with with some of the younger members of the audience. But back in the day when I was a child and I was in my father's car, my father's car had an eight track cassette player. Yes, a cassette player. And it also had a rev counter and a speedometer. And that's about the size of the, the equipment that was in the dash of my father's car. Um, the monitoring devices that are in the modern day car have got a myriad of functions to give you optimal performance of the car and also um, miles per gallon and 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 uh, deflation systems on the car. So there's many, many mon monitors throughout the whole vehicle telling you how the vehicle is progressing. So effectively, that's what we want to be looking at with monitoring for longevity. And as Tim Dwyer, the University College Lecturer at, at um, UCL stated in the October edition of SIBS journal, water monitoring should not be considered simply as a retrofit once a system has gone awry, but properly included as part of the initial design. And I think that's the functionality we want you to think about today. So the learning objectives for tonight, this CPD module explains why, despite sound standards uh, and guidelines, many heating and cooling systems still suffer from often disastrous and costly effects of corrosion. Of course, explains what causes corrosion in closed systems and how it can be best avoided. It can go on to show that continuous monitoring of system corrosion rates and other key factors can prevent high costs associated with corrosion damage. And if anybody's out there has had clients with high um, OPEX expenditure on corrosion damage throughout a, heat, a heating or a chilled water system, you'll know all about those kind of costs. A um, number of different contents um, and they're on screen just now. We'll allow you to have a look at the process as we look at that, but we will take you through worked examples at the end of that process um, and you will become familiar with how best to examine the processes. So first question we asked ourselves is why do heating systems corrode? Well, we, the reason we have sealed systems, and I note with interest when I was doing a bit of research for the region uh, earlier on today, that ham were they presented to your region some months ago, um, and they were basically talking about um, boiler installations on open and sealed systems. And what they were talking about is that um, the modern day boilers hate dirty water and it's one of the reasons why in Europe most of uh, indeed all of the systems are sealed and pressurized. We have some open vented systems in the United Kingdom but most nowadays are all designed as sealed systems and the reason we do that are 
are designed to prevent corrosion. So if they are sealed and we're designing them correctly, then why are we having such issues? In addition, most systems in the United Kingdom in particular are treated with corrosion inhibitors. How do we measure the efficiency of such corrosion inhibitors and the process that are involved? There are many UK standards and guidelines all aimed at minimising corrosion. And suffice to say that um, subject to the contributions of Bisria members, of which we are one, in 2018, then BG29 was um, changed in 2020 and subsequently again in 2021 as the sixth edition was uh, was developed and also the revision to that came very quickly after it, BG50. So BG29 deals with the flushing and cleaning of sealed systems and BG50 deals with the water, water treatment of systems after they are practically completed and handed over. Um, in addition to that process, you've obviously got various British standards, but as you can see from the date of these British standards, probably some of them could do with a bit of revision and bringing up to innovative technology and, and different approaches within different materials that we're now using. ICOM, uh, the Commercial Heating and Systems Guide, is also a source of information for the process produced by um, the water treatment companies and the boiler manufacturers predominantly. Uh, SIBS AM14 on the commissioning guides, uh, W guide B and M also cover the aspects, as does other numerous European standards of which VDI 2035, some of you may have become aware of because it's promoted in SIBS Heat Network's Code of Practice for the UK uh, CP1. So these are all effectively new publications which all pick up on water quality because water quality is the lifeblood of our heating and cooling systems that are sealed. So it's pretty important that we treat it with the best possible processes that we can and the most cost effective processes at that stage. So just an extract from CP1. It basically talks about best practice with the systematic monitor, monitor corrosion in systems using the electronic coupon method. Uh, and obviously at the same time, it measures pressures and temperatures. So the operational efficiency of the system is, is pretty important as well. So historically, uh, despite standards that we've had, everyone in the business has come across numerous aspects of corrosion fouling in systems. Um, some of it is relatively straightforward that you can find out in your domestic premises as well as your commercial premises. Some of it less so. So, and again, going back to the SIBS journal, SIBS module 157, ensuring heat network water quality for effective plate, brazed plate heat exchangers. And this is where SWEP effectively came across our organisation and were interested in developing us as the northern distributor of their product. Because for a plate brazed plate heat exchanger or any plate heat exchanger to operate effectively and for us to ensure the reduction of carbon within our built estate, uh, and the build out of heat networks across the UK being one of the functions in that process. We need to make sure that that water is doing the optimal performance to these systems. Because if we don't, we start to have these systems falling over, fouling, costs rising. We end up having a mini Grenfell moment with heating heat network systems. And as John Greaves from um, an organisation contributed in that publication, out of the illustrated 185 heat networks they looked at, 15% of them had suffered failures as a result of issues around water quality. That's potentially at that stage, 2,573 systems at risk when you were looking at the 1,700 in that particular subset. And this were ramping this out to escalate up towards 14 to 20% of heat demand in 2030. So this is pretty important that we get this right. This is from a particular heat network uh, outskirts of Edinburgh, which had failed components within a very, very short period of time, i.e. within practical completion. This needs to be avoided as it best possibly can. Again, another aspect of a heat network where we've not actually in a column radiator, we've not actually got water to the top of the column radiator. We've got a tide, tide mark in that process, which potentially could have um, caused all sorts of issues with the air being uh, sitting in the top of that radiator at the scene. The real problem often remains invisible from the outside and still it's far too late. So the reciprocating pumps, um, other apparatus will prematurely fail in the operation of that system and the functionality of that system will be impaired. So if systems are so well protected from corrosion, why has the whole industry developed around power flushing and system cleaning? We don't want to be over cleaning 
a system with discharging water. The water should not be discolouring in a significant process as long as we're dealing with the fundamental causes in the first instance. If you actually put in the term power flushing, you'll get, as I did on Monday, 41,600,000 hits on Google. It tells you there's an awful lot of activity in that process. Um, but is that process serving best the material that's in your system? Sales of and a variety of filters and magnetic dirt separators have exploded um, in the United Kingdom. Now, we're a distributor of such devices, but we've always been a distributor of deaeration and dirt separation. There's been a change in the marketplace where we don't use the term deaeration. We also stopped using the term temperature differential deaeration, which defines the operational functionality of that product. And what we've reverted to is an air and dirt separator couple of reasons for that. We struggle to spell deration being one of them, um, but temperature differential deration doesn't quite run roll off the tongue as much as air and dirt separation. But what I want you to think about is temperature differential deration needs temperature differential for it to deaerate. Otherwise, it is simply an air and dirt separator. And air, free air, not in solution, is only half of the problem. The bigger problem is dissolved air absorbed air in solution at a different temperature and a different pressure within the system. So dirt separation is only one aspect of the problem. We need to think about deaeration. We need to think about dissolved oxygen in the system. So which of the following may be contributing to corrosion problems? Now, I know the vast majority of the audience are SIBSI members, so they may be designing systems. So they're certainly not bad design systems in your projects, but occasionally we get poor system design. Choice of materials need to be considered. We need to think about the materials that we put into the system and we build the system and know of all the materials that are inside the system in order that we can get the water quality correct for those materials that are in the system. Modern high efficiency components do not like dirty or air filled water. They need to have clear, concise system water in sealed systems without regular filling and refilling or makeup into that system. So modern high efficiency components require rapid heat transfer and they basically had large surface areas and we don't want to have any interface of air or dirt impacting on their operation. I'm not going to talk about cost cutting, poor training or poor maintenance because we should be chasing these aspects out of the industry in order to maintain our operational assets for the longevity that they require. Incorrect or poor chemical treatment regimes. Well, as we've said with system design, um, unfortunately, we can have regimes that are not effective or are not managed properly, and they need to be um, rooted out and basically found to be effective or not. And if they are, we need to change that process. And the implication of mixed metals needs to be considered, and I'll discuss in a wee bit of detail, a wee bit long, um, more on that just in the next couple of slides. All of these can lead to corrosion problems in our sealed systems. And there are many types of corrosion. There is not just one type of corrosion, but the principal cause of corrosion is uniform oxygen corrosion. Um, the creation of um, corrosion product um, as a result of excess oxygen into the system on an ongoing basis. Galvanic corrosion is the corrosion between two anodic and cathodic materials within the system when we set up a um, corrosive cell through the um, presence of oxygen in the system and also the continuation of um, differential metals within that process. Crevice corrosion, pitting corrosion, under deposit corrosion, microbial induced corrosion or MIC as it's called in the process, intergranular corrosion, erosion corrosion and stress corrosion. Numerous terms and many aspects of corrosion that are all called into play and deemed by ourselves, and as we consider them to be irregular forms of corrosion, um, but generally the biggest product in the room is effectively the presence of oxygen as the devil in the space. Effectively, oxygen is the devil in the room that is driving this corrosion triangle. So we have water, we have steel, if we have continual presence of oxygen in there, 
we have corrosion as an aspect of that treatment coming into the space. So that devil in the room is the oxygen molecules that were in the initial fill water and can be inputted into the makeup water if we're frequently making up the process. Without one of these components, uniform oxygen corrosion cannot take place. Because without of the oxygen molecules forcing themselves onto the iron, which is the fundamental process of steel, we will not create the red rust and black sludge that we have uh, frequently seen in some of the earlier slides. Corrosion is not just limited to steel, however, and consideration should be taken if we're also using the effects of aluminium within the system. Stainless steel, brass and copper are prone to electrical potential, um, uh, metal or pH elevated um, reduction in pH or alternatively um, sulfate and chlorines coming in and damaging those materials within the particular process as well. So it is not just a steel problem. Uh, in fact, exponentially, the move towards um, non-ferrous materials, but with still a, a residual element of um, ferrous materials in your systems, well, if we don't tackle this oxygen problem, the ferrous material that remains in your system will exponentially corrode quicker because you've replaced and substituted large volumes of um, steel with um, non-ferrous material. In nearly all cases of excessive corrosion, high levels of oxygen are to blame. So why are we getting high levels of oxygen in a sealed, closed system? We could also think about substitution of the principal fluid. So the water that we use to circulate our heat or cooling around our builds, buildings could be used uh, and, and substituted for thermal oil. It's not terribly sustainable. It's not terribly um, cost effective. Um, and in building services, there is no chance of that ever being adopted. Water is a ch cheap resource, even though some of it we think is getting more and more expensive or our utilities, but it's too cheap and we are very wasteful with it as a resource. We need to be more prudent with that resource, in my opinion. We could substitute the steel and we have been substituting with steel, with stainless steel and other materials, plastics, um, uh, but thinking that the issue is resolved, I mentioned earlier on that this excessive use of a substitute for steel, yet with re residual steel still used in our radiators, buffer vessels and other materials in the, in the, in the system, exponentially elevates the rate of uh, um, corrosion that you will do to that residual steel because you've got the uh, non-corrodible materials in that instance that basically shifts the oxygen consumption onto that original steel that you've got left in the system. Or we can eliminate the oxygen from the system and keeping it keep it out of the system. So we won't we can't eliminate the oxygen from the initial fill or indeed from the initial air that's in the system as we start to first fill it. But we will start to look at how best we can suppress that oxygen once we have this system. Uh, practically filled and the neutral point established and over pressure at the highest points. We talked about the implications of mixed metals um, and the ideal pH um, for passive, passivity um, of metals in heating systems. And generally speaking, under the German engineering standard of VDI 2035, and in addition, I think the, the standards within the UK under BG50, we're tending, as long as we don't have aluminium in the system, we are tending to lead towards a pH of around 8.2 up to about 10. Um, ideally in the mid range of about um, uh, um, about eight and a half, eight point seven is where we target range for most of this, the, the, the shared material within that process. But your pH from the neutral tap water is always going to elevate itself as it goes into the initial passivation process as it goes into the uh, system um, and it will generally find a, a balance at around that level. It should not be dropping dramatically underneath uh, the neutral point of pH seven unless there's something going awry inside that system. So when we're eliminating oxygen, and if we define that to be key, we need to acknowledge that in the initial fill, oxygen is held in solution in the water. So wherever we are in the world, the atmospheric and ambient condition, we basically, for every cubic meter of water, we have 23 liters of air entrained in solution. Now that's a comment from William Henry's law of absorption of a gas and a liquid at a, a given state, and it's 1803 chemistry. So effectively, as we drive the temperature of the water up, we drive the 
air content out of the water effectively. I'm a Scotsman. I reside in Edinburgh. I occasionally I get uh, persuaded to have a drink with my friends. If I have too many, I come home and I know I have to rehydrate and I put a glass of water um, in my hand and I drink as much as I possibly can with it. But I've probably had too much to drink, so I don't want to drink too, any more water. So I leave a glass at the side of my bed and I wake up in the morning and the heatings came on in my house and I've got bubbles coalescing in the inside of the glass. That is temperature differential duration in front of your eyes. It happens most days. You'll have came across it, I'm sure, myself, whether you've been drinking or not. So leave a glass of water out for a long period of time, it will coalesce to the side of the glass. That's the air coming out of solution and coalescing to the side of the glass. So drinking water contains approximately 10 litres per cubic metre or 10 milligrams per every litre of oxygen. And as we drive the temperature up, we drive the oxygen content out. Now that's where I made the earlier comment that the free air that's in a system when we backfill it with water we force that air out through our automatic air valves, the water level rises to the top of the system, but we've still not done anything about the dissolved oxygen content in the water. We will consume that in the passivation of a large steel system, and it will suppress pretty quickly as long as we're not constantly backing up that water, or alternatively, we are allowing air to migrate into the system through various different means more of that in a little second. So in our opinion, repeated draining and filling during pre-commissioning, cleaning and commissioning adds more oxygen and will undoubtedly lead to more corrosion. So we need to minimise the processes of having to drain and fill and hence why we're not a massive lover of the process of power flushing. Power flushing should only be adopted when we know that the system water is beyond repair and we can't do anything to improve that process. So after pressure testing and or cleaning, a system must never be left empty for a long period of time. And precision carbon steel manufacturers have been very quick to make sure that everybody understands that process as they try and recover from some of the um, truth and rumour um, myths that were created around their particular product, but um, more of that in different presentations effectively. But suffice to say that repeating draining and filling during pre-commissioning, as I mentioned before, is a bad idea for, it adds more oxygen and leads to more corrosion. So oxygen is consumed after filling in an untreated system. So even in an untreated system, the oxygen content will mitigate and deviate and, and reduce because of the steel uh, surface area that you will allow the passivation process to, to occur. So that will assume, uh, consume sorry, the initial oxygen content in that process. So very quickly uh, after circulation in a cold state, we will start to have a very low limit of oxygen value in the, in the system and which will limit the oxygen process. And I'll show you worked examples of that in our case study evidence that we'll show towards the end of the process. I mentioned to you that uh, for every cubic meter of water, uh, ambient and atmospheric around the world, we have 23 litres of air. And I told you that 10 litres of that is oxygen. The other residual balance of air, most of it is nitrogen. And nitrogen is a uh, inert gas and does not drive any oxygen issues, but it will present issues when we have heat transfer, sorry, heat transfer capabilities or indeed noise transmission. If you hear if you he overtly hear a pump circulating, or if you overtly hear fluid going through a reduced um, orifice TRV and when you when you move the TRV the, the noise goes away that's because you're effectively having a large pressure drop on that thermostatic radiator valve and when you're adjusting that valve you're opening up the valve you're no longer getting the big reduction in pressure um, across the valve which by definition a reduction in pressure allows gas to come out of solution as well so any of these instances that you discover in a heat in a system generally are related to air related uh, problems as well. So there are early signs that you may well have oxygen corrosion occurring. This is an extract from the Dutch corrosion guidance document and it effectively um, is quite handy because it just shows us exactly the levels of magnetite that's created during the first fill and the initial filling process um, of a standard thousand litre system, I think it is. Um, 
and it effectively deals with the minute level of topping up when you've got pressurization correctly it's correctly achieved if however you do not have the pressurization functionality of the system in a sealed system correctly achieved and you have negative pressure you're effectively at some stages in that process pulling air into the system on a constant regular basis and by definition that system is no longer mechanically sealed it's actually oxygenating itself every evening either when the system cools or indeed it could be oxygenating itself during operation with an AAV sucking air into the system constantly that's when you start to get large volumes of magnetite in your system Plastic pipe, make sure that you know what the permeation rate is for your plastic piping systems. Make sure that we have an effective and resilient barrier in those plastic pipes and make sure that the actual fitting arrangement on those plastic pipes is effective and meets the same um, permeation rates that are quoted in the specification of that material. Diffusion of rubber hoses and rubber um, braided hoses, flexible connections, is also a large contributor to oxygen because permeation of that um, flexible large meters, large kilometers indeed on some of the larger um, developments have um, hoses that can permeate oxygen into the system. So through partial differential pressure, water will not leach out, but oxygen can leach in into the system, migrate into the system and cause that issue and diffusion of the expansion of the vessels. So depending upon the quality of our expansion vessel, we can lose the gas charge in our expansion vessel. Um, and if we're replenishing that with standard air through a, an air compressor, for example, that uh, again will allow oxygen to come into the system and the diffusion of that expansion vessel could potentially allow us to put negative pressure onto the system, which I'll show you in a wee second. So how does uh, oxygen enter the system in a sealed system? Well, generally because of poor pressure control accounts for 90% of all corrosion problems in our um, opinion. So a lack of understanding of the standard processes of EN12828 is significantly um, to be accountable for large corrosion problems. And that can often be that the expansion vessels are too small, either by design or by uh, value engineering or whatever purposes are, we haven't actually correctly designed the expansion vessels when we're talking about fixed diaphragm expansion vessels, which account for nine out, nine out of 10 projects. The occasional project, we will talk about pump and compressor type pressurization systems for the very, very large systems, but nine times out of 10 expansion vessels, um, fixed diaphragm expansion vessels or bladder type expansion vessels will be your principal point of pressurization. So if we haven't correctly got the pre-charge pressure, either it is too high or it's too low, we have, will not achieve the correct EN128 understanding. Now I'm not going to talk to you greatly about EN128, but I am going to 28, but I am going to point out a few pointers to you. Loss of pre-charge pressure and lack of maintenance. So uh, the FM providers or the maintain maintenance contractor needs to be aware that they need to manually and annually check the pre-charge pressure of their expansion vessels and um, particularly if, if they're getting a call to that process with a um, corrosion monitor driving that process and getting people to look into that aspect of it. Incorrect pump, posi pump position or the incorrect um, expansion vessel connection onto the system i.e. the neutral point will lead to issues as well and defective bag or membrane if the um, bag or the membrane inside the expansion vessel fails or indeed if we're using a spill type system and we're taking fluid out of the system exposing it to atmosphere and the atmospheric charge on that water basically re-oxygenates the water and then we pump it back into the system that will trigger off a, cor a corrosion event effectively as minimal or as um, significant as the frequency of that process as we spill and fill back into the system. If we have leaks, then let's attend to the leaks. Let's resolve those leaks in the system. Let's not allow the pressurization unit to simply continuously automatic topping up with fresh or 
uh, raw water that I think one of your colleagues in an earlier submission from Hamburg they mentioned. New modern day boilers do not like dirty water. We should not be getting any dirty water into our systems. Heat exchangers, the high efficiency braze plate heat exchangers do not like for, um, dirty water. Compensation for water loss um, through a safety valve by means of topping up should only really be happening if we've got incorrect pressure control in the system. The safety valve is discharging because we've, we've escalated the, the, the uh, operating pressures within the system. We should be really understanding why a safety valve that um, is discharging when it's half a bar above the maximum um, pressure that the system should be coming across uh, is discharging water through that process. Something is inherently wrong in the, in the understanding of pressure control in the system. And we touched on diffusion earlier on, as we mentioned, rubber fan co hoses, EPDM is highly permeable, and non-barrier plastic pipes. The reason that we have barrier plastic pipe nowadays is because the stuff before was all non-barrier. So some of the earlier underfloor heating systems in a lot of commercial buildings are effectively oxygen sinks, allowing oxygen to sink into the system and are kicking off a corrosion problem inside steel systems. Like everything in life, position matters and where we put these devices matters. So the neutral point is the connection on the shunt retain return header where we would have our expansion vessel sized correctly and operation and with a standard of that vessel as best as and cost effective as you can get. We don't want the cheapest vessels in there. We want to make sure that the, the membranes effectively perhaps are made of butyl rather than standard EPDM and that we can maybe have a replaceable bladder rather than having to do away with the whole expansion vessel. Um, and that they're correctly sized, and I'll show you um, how we go about that in a second. Dirt separators, um, forgive me for the colour these units, other units are available. Um, effectively, a dirt separator positioned to provide a laminar no-flow zone, so effectively particulate um, heavier than water can drop out and be discharged whenever we um, choose to do so, looking at the water quality as it's discharged, minimising water discharge from the system is a, a effective way of taking debris out of the system. But remember, the debris we're taking out of the system, nine times out of ten, is our system. So we should not be fixated by large volumes of debris coming out of the system. We should be making sure that that water runs as best clear as we possibly can for as long as we possibly can. Pressurisation units or vacuum degas pressurisation units are beneficial if uh, they can be afforded in the system. And we will touch and I'll show you more about the corrosion monitors that will come and validate the selection of all this equipment and operation of this equipment with graphical representation of data as we go through it. We said position matters, size matters as well. So we basically want to look at what I'm going to just quickly do is look at a selection of an expansion vessel for an identical system. It's a very small system. We've put some figures into a particular selection chart and we've got a, a calculated vessel volume that we need for the system at 130 litres. So we pick the first vessel above that collected volume and yes, 150 litres will do the process. But look at the settings that that's going to allow us to achieve. We have a cold fill pressure of a minimum of 1.79 bar and a cold fill pressure maximum of 1.92 bar. We've got a deviation of 0.13 bar. Now remember, when we size this vessel, we probably do it at the design stage where a normal amount of assumptions have been taken into consideration. If we avail this to the commissioning engineer and he needs to fill that system above a cold fill maximum pressure of 1.92, he cannot achieve it with that vessel. If, however, we chose to go one size up, which might be an extra 70, 80 pounds, um, 100 euros, whatever the, the currency conversion rate is, Rob will correct me if I'm wrong, um, effectively allows us half a bar of deviation in the cold fill pressure to make sure that the commissioning engineer can actually commission that system as best he possibly can once he takes practical um, possession of the circuit. So effectively, in our opinion, let's go a wee bit bigger on our expansion vessels. Let's make sure we certainly have document and record evidence of what our expansion vessel sizes are for our sealed heating and cooling systems. We talked about permeation and I talked about the preference that if you can 
specify a butyl bladder in your vessels. That's because butyl is less permeable, considerably less permeable than EPDM. So effectively, just step back to that selection there. If we went for that very tight cold fill pressure and went for an EPDM vessel, we would lose that gas pressure even though we might have just been at the right cold fill pressure to achieve overpressure at the head of the system at 0.3 bar in accordance with the N12828, we would lose that ideal position, uh, position very quickly. We might leave it, lose it in the first year. And I'm going to show you a case study where we can basically kind of show you that that's exactly what happens all too often in the process. If we use butyl, because the permeation is considerably less, we will hold that vessel um, gas charge in that vessel for a fair a, a longer period of time, to some extent, maybe five times longer than the EPDM vessel. So an investment in that small commodity can actually have significant benefits and reap benefits with regards to corrosion protection. So if you were all in a room today, um, and I don't know how many of, exact many of you are out there, but if we were all in the room today and we're looking at the methods of corrosion monitoring, the traditional methods are water sampling is what we tend to use throughout the industry at this moment in time. Um, we also used to historically use corrosion coupons. And when we were pre-COVID, when we were traveling up and down the country, I would often ask everybody in the room if they're familiar with corrosion coupons. Um, the vast majority, and I mean the vast majority, in excess of 90% had never ever heard of corrosion coupons. Fairly straightforward process. They're just the principal material consideration of the metal that's in the system, and we leave them in the system for a period of time, and we take them away back to the lab from whence they came, and we measure the corrosion rate across those predetermined measured uh, coupons that we uh, installed in the system. And it tells us how much corrosion activity has occurred, how much degradation has occurred to that material. It obviously requires installation of the coupons. It obviously requires removal of the coupons, replacement of the coupons. It's quite a labour intensive process and it's just giving you the corrosion rate across a period of time. It's not showing the, the vagaries of corrosion within a sealed system. We can also use removable pipe sections. And I got an email today from a client today to, um, from a particular organisation that we met at um, SIBS Build to Perform in November at Excel. And this estate were basically saying that occasionally they take sections of pipe out and have a look inside the pipe to see if they consider it to be um, uh, commensurate with continuing to use that piping system and, and prevent them from replacing it. It's a pretty crude process, but it is used in some industries for them to look at sections of pipe. But again, pretty labour or intensive. Advanced methods of corrosion monitoring have been used in industry for quite some time. The linear polarization resistance or LPR method in the bottom right corner is effectively principally used in a lot of process, but not least of which the petrochemical process industries. And it is um, can be quite an expensive process to utilize um, in, in both cost and in interpretation of the process. We have sensors that can measure uh, pH, conductivity and dissolved oxygen, um, individual sensors, and they lead back to main um, control um, uh, circuit boards and they're taking zero to 10 volt or various different sensor um, uh, feeds back to that panel. But they will require um, relatively frequent recalibration, particularly pH requires um, at least annual, if not biannual, um, recalibration of a pH sensor, and these sensors can be quite cost, expend, uh, cost prohibitive. Corrosion monitoring through the electronic coupon method, or ECM, as in CP1, is effectively the method that um, we will introduce to you here. And effectively, that direct corrosion measurement through the loss of material mass and not looking at simple water chemistry in isolation is we are trying to relevant the loss of an an iron coupon at the tip of the probe and we're measuring that every 20 minutes and delivering an annualized corrosion rate in micron meters per year every seven hours. So we're actually delivering a, a yearly corrosion rate every seven hours based on the, what we've witnessed for the seven hours that we're looking at. 
Upon creation of that, it will give you an instant volt free contact warning when corrosion rates exceed the set level that's in the factory default that leaves the unit. It can be reduced should you wish to have that at a lower level or increased at a higher level, depending upon the system you're fitting it to. And it also records temperature. It's not instantaneous temperature that's recording or continuous. It's an interval temperature looking at the temperature during the 20 minute periods and across a platform of that seven hours that we're validating. And this can be used to validate technical monitoring and improved and, and improved seasonal commissioning because you can get a good understanding of what's actually happening across the, the full seasonal adjustment of the probe. Graphic output and assistance with cause finding will come into play when you're using such devices and there is optional units that were soft launched with the, the addition of pressure into that process um, earlier on in the year. So why monitor system corrosion? Although the corrosion process is fast, it takes time before the damage becomes disruptive. An early warning that the corrosion rate in the system has increased allows timely and preventative intervention to allow you to resolve the said problems. Water sampling is not very reliable and will not always reveal that there is a problem. For cost saving reasons, it's often done too infrequently or not done at all. Corrosion coupons are a sound method, but only indicate a corrosion rate over a longer period of time, minimum probably three months, and do not give a vote free contact warning. LPR linear polarisation is accurate, but it can be expensive, maybe becoming prohibitive in building services it's for others to decide. Sensors that detect water quality can be useful, but need expert interpretation, maintenance and recalibration. And the newest method of the ECM method is um, combines the accuracy of coupons with the ease of reading and recording of a permanent sensor. So to be able to act in time, it's essential to have some form of early warning or alarm system. And the recent aspects of guidance generally moves towards best practice adoption of such methods of monitoring in the building services industry. And how we achieve that, uh, we effectively present you with a corrosion profile history in numerous circuits. This has got overlaid with three particular loggers and we've got temperature circuits within that process. So these loggers can be at different locations. You can get different results at different locations because of the pressurization of that system. And this interpretation is accessible via our free Rhesus dashboard software, which is availed by a simple download. And once you have a fitted unit, an operational unit into your system, you can achieve these graphs and build these into reports of your particular performance of the history. So I'm going to show you some field examples uh, that we've utilized, not every single one of them, but just a few. This is a particular <coughs> um, dwelling in Germany. Uh, it's effectively a 31 kilowatt biomass boiler. It's got two and a half kilowatt kilometers of underflow heating pipe work in there, various different um, piping materials, barrier plastic pipe, a boiler heat exchanger, steel and towel rads, and a 1000 litre buffer vessel, and heat stations with copper and um, plate heat exchangers that are built in there in brass fittings. It has a RISIC or corrosion monitor fitted in the buffer vessel um, and it's system filled with uh, 1500 litres of softened water because it's in a hard, hard water area. They've softened the water as they've filled the system. It does not have chemicals inhibitors because it's a VDI 2035 system, the German Association Engineers process and guidance for corrosion control. The aeration and dirt separators are fitted and there's an oversized expansion vessel. And this is the data that comes off that system. This is system from our cloud. So this is the last known corrosion rate. This was actually taken yesterday. Uh, 24 micron meters up here would be where the basically corrosion rate would um, start to alarm. As you can see, we're not having any alarming activity in that process. And when you interpret the CSV file data that we get off the data, we are getting system life data of less than 1.3 micron meters per year. Now, I mentioned precision carbon steel earlier on. Precision carbon steel, the smallest diameter precision carbon steel, has a thickness of 1200 micron meters. A micron meter is a millionth of a meter or a thousandth of a millimeter. When we're getting down to levels of this kind of um, corrosion in this particular system, we have got very, very minimal corrosion in that system. The only high activity we've had in the system historically was at the initial fill of the system back in 2016. And this is the water that's still coming from that particular system. Um, as you can see, we can achieve 
fairly um, significant results as long as we look after the quality of that conditioned water within these processes. I talked about pressurisation being important. This is one of our initial uh, earlier adopted units in Perth Crematorium when they did a, a replacement of this process. The uh, unit was actually just should have probably been on the shunt return. This side of the unit it was on the expansion vessel volume. This is the X2, the earlier um, adopted unit when we first introduced the, 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 the devices. Um, but when we looked at the data, unfortunately, whenever the contractor didn't quite engage the logger to the probe on the initial fill. But what we do know from this data when it was first connected in the um, middle of June in 2019, we know it was on a Tuesday afternoon. And why do we know that? Because we had Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of heating. There is only minimal backup heating on Saturday and Sunday. And then we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then we have these five peaks effectively. You'll see the corrosion rate here is negligible. 24 micron meters is when we would send the alarm off to the system. We haven't alarmed the system. However, we communicated with the council back in February 2020 and we saw frequency of alarm activity. But when you actually correlate that down, it's alarming and jumping when we're at the weekend and when we're at the weekend the water cools down the expansion volume reduces and we potentially are allowing air to migrate into the system because we don't have overpressure at the head of the system so the automatic air valves are sucking air into the system every weekend that kind of shows us that process and we would want them to readjust that gas charge make sure the vessels a bigger size uh, and readjust that particular charge in that vessel Kelsen Carlo, it was a particular project when the demise of the Carillion construction site um, it basically collapsed with a partial completion of the project. The clients wanted to find out exactly the, the potential uh, status of the system pipe work. And we, we don't have a crystal ball. We can't go backwards, but we can put monitors on that would allow us to look at the corrosion rates going forward in that system. And if nothing had significantly changed from the introduction of the corrosion monitors, it would be suffice to say that that corrosion rate had been going on for a wee while. Um, and it would be give you some confidence that if they're not excessive, we would effectively take that process through for a longer period of time. So when we looked at the corrosion rates, we weren't alarmed at any of them. We obviously had a bit of history when we were filling the system at the end points for optimal corrosion control, but we're still comfortable to move with the client at that stage. Another example on the outskirts of Edinburgh is Harvester's Way, an award-winning uh, adopted process in a heat network where we're doing 183 maisonettes, flats and townhouses. In the old traditional boiler installation with a boiler in every kitchen wall, we'd probably be looking at about four megawatt of gas on this particular network. Peak load in 2016 was effectively measured at 400 kilowatts. And I think the consultant told me the other day we were up at 264 kilowatts, even though Edinburgh's temperatures were down at minus three. So as they've built out this estate, it's become a lot more um, viable from a heat network point of view. Again, a previous unit in the return header, no corrosion activity in the system, minimal activity. Some original water treatment reports that came off of the site and um, end of practical completion. We were reasonably happy with the results from the initial fill water. Edinburgh water is very, very soft, tends to be quite soft at 94 micro siemens um, per, squares, uh, per, per centimetre and affected a pH at neutral 7.2. As I mentioned to you, it will climb normally with the introduction of um, levels of inhibitors could be suggested the inhibitor levels mildly weak in the system, but that in itself does not necessarily say that you're getting corrosion activity. It just tells you that the inhibitor level is, is maybe beyond the recommendation of the water treatment company. We didn't do much to it because we didn't really need to do much to it or we didn't think we did. Um, effectively, we're continuously being told that the um, system inhibitor level requires topping up albeit that the, the levels were maintaining their, 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 in their level from before. We then get a spurious result where the pH on the system has changed from 9 down to 6.9, um, which could only really occur if they discharged the whole heat network system water and filled it with neutral water. Um, so we have to question this, uh, this particular report when it came through in the third year. 
Um, and the reason we were questioning that information is because we had the risk or information from initial inception of September 2017, because we'd only had two to three corrosion activities, where two of these significant corrosion activities were as a result of us in forcing the, the FM contractor who was looking after the site to actually physically charge the vessels correctly in accordance with the original design and practical completion on the project. They had been charging for historically doing it, but they hadn't been doing it because they hadn't been recharging and replacing the water in the actual expansion vessels. So with better evidence, you'll make better decisions, you'll get the contractor to do better jobs. As we said, Utilising the CSV file from the data, you will get very low levels of corrosion rate in that system. And everyone, even the water treatment samples that we were getting, were all showing that the water was clear and free of particulate. So both visual evidence and risicore evidence were pointing in the right direction. Another from the same um, incumbent places for people, we basically tracked one of the issues down to a you know, a less than comprehensive automatic air valve at the top of the buffer vessels and effectively with replacing them with competent and very well engineered automatic air valves we suddenly found that the issues we were resolving and experiencing on a regular basis as they were building out the development basically had led to alarming levels of activity but fortunately, we now we have arrested that and we're now basically as they've built out the full project and readjusted the cold fill pressure on the project and pressurised the system correctly, we're getting very, very low um, stable corrosion rates on the system. So in any system, get to know your average yearly corrosion rate. It's a new term. Try and think of it as best you possibly can in the process of a traffic light system. If your average yearly corrosion rates or AYCR are coming in underneath seven micron meters per year, remember that precision carbon steel in its, in its smallest diameter is 1200 micron meters per year. There's little chance of you achieving any corrosion damage in these systems at that particular function. If it's escalating above 21 and the alarm is continually going off on your risk or then you have serious chance of corrosion failure and you could be spending a lot of money on uh, remediation of that system problem. For optimum corrosion monitoring, you want to monitor circuits uh, both at the cold feed topping up or the shunt return circuit, as I showed in the earlier um, schematic. You then want to monitor the circuits that reach the top of the systems and or the furthermost extremities, i.e. the index legs on perhaps the VT and the CT circuits on your heating systems if it's on a particular large building. If it's on a very small building that you've just got a small boiler that's uh, circulating water around a small premise, your shunt return or your, or your boiler return uh, measurement is going to be sufficient for that process. But bear in mind that monitor circuits containing plastic pipes or EPDM hoses, which are not diffusion tight, because these areas could be your area where permeation and diffusion into the system of oxygen and air is the principal root cause of the problem. Construction is unfortunately under digitalized still um, and a report done by McKinsey's uh, commissioned by MBS basically um, registered this some years ago in actual fact and it looked at productivity growth between 2005 and 2014 and unfortunately construction lagged at the bottom of that curve. Even agricultural, forestry and fishing uh, were above that because fish, fishing vessels and, and when they go into the sea, they recognise where the fish are and where they aren't, and basically they very quickly move on when and G global positioning uh, devices will tell them where they are. Similarly, a tractor in a field will be told that he's ploughed that particular section of the field. He doesn't need to go back to it. Um, we need to start to get more smart buildings and uh, in internet of things into our buildings and even our retained estate so that we can make better judgments and better decisions. So smart buildings deliver a solid foundation to enhance a building's attractiveness and sustainability and efficiency. This technology will actually make FMs more valuable as they can provide strategic guidance on all of this data. So we can probably overcome the difference between hard and soft FM and we can make sure that that hard bounce um, can be improved somewhat. Um, so it's about predictability and less about a simple help desk. So in summary, despite many good standards and guidelines, corrosion is still a problem, not just precision carbon steel. Modern system components are much more susceptible to corrosion sludge. Therefore, the problem will get worse, not better. Corrosion inhibitors 
are not a universal miracle cure in isolation. They um, can be utilised when um, projects require and cannot be avoided uh, and are effectively certainly required in open systems. But uh, even in sealed systems, we can achieve very low levels of corrosion activity without continual replenishment of inhibitors. Overdosing in a system is just as big a problem as um, pressurisation in some of these systems. By reducing oxygen levels, it's possible to achieve very low levels of corrosion even without inhibitors. Corrosion caused by the first fill is minimal and not detrimental. Frequent refill is to be avoided. So correct pressure control monitoring and minimising topping up is vital for enhanced pressurising control. Vac vacuum degassing make up water can only be advantageous if affordable. We commend Bizria for their approach within the recent re revision to the guidance and we certainly commend SIBS for CP1 for the introduction of the term of VDI 2035 and uh, table 17 alongside table 16 dealing with the the water treatment aspects of heat networks. Smart sensors such as risk or corrosion sensor sends alarm upon increased corrosion levels and records the entire history of the system. And we really want to make greater consideration, although Brexit has led us to turn our back on our northern European neighbours, we need to understand that the reason CP1 and SIBS, net, SIBS heat networks introduced the term of VDI 2035 is because all of our European colleagues have been building out these district heat networks for a lot longer than we have, and they certainly adopt different standards in the prevention of corrosion in these systems. It is something that we need to be well aware of. So if you've heard of the golden thread and why it matters, transparency is required as condition-based maintenance will improve technical monitoring and commissioning and delivering predictive maintenance. I personally think the golden thread terminology was superb, but I think it needed to be called a golden rope because in my opinion, golden, the, the thread can be broken too easily and will be by those that wish to do so. We need to make sure that that holds for as best we possibly can. Corrosion monitoring solutions are in the modern day guidance. Um, and different temperature sensors and probes. And if you adopt um, uh, semi-regular uh, water monitoring as well, make sure that we actually cover the areas that are required under these systems. But generally speaking, we are looking at dissolved oxygen, water makeup volumes uh, and metallic corrosion rates in priority. The units are on MBS for anybody that's interested in specification of the units, and there are a large growing audience that are embracing that process. Don't take a chance on corrosion and change your process of thought into that. You'll be very surprised by the process. So I've gone through that as best I possibly can. I know it's taken me an hour to get through it. There was a lot of content that's involved in that process, but on behalf of HASL and my colleague Rob Vizers from Rhesus, I'd like to thank you for your attendance today, and I'd like to thank SIBS and um, the Home Counties South East for allowing us the pleasure to present to you. My name's Gordon Pringle. If I haven't bored you to tears, link in with me through LinkedIn or follow me on Twitter uh, at Jugtastic67. And if I ever get to meet you, I'll call, tell you why I'm called Jugtastic67. Um, technical due diligence is coming more into focus, and with the power of Internet of Things, you will be able to deliver that process to the best of your achievable gains. Stephen, it's over to you to see if there's any particular questions that you've got from the audience or if anybody wants to pop a question in the chat. We'll pick that up as we go through, but um, thank you very much for your time and uh, I'll take your questions now. Sure, thank you, Gordon. Thanks very much. And uh, Gordon, um, a copy of this presentation will be sent to myself and Ella. I think you're going to send that. No. And uh, it will also be on the uh, SIBSI YouTube site in the next few days as well. So people will be able to uh, listen to it again. And, uh, and uh, some very good numbers tonight, uh, Gordon, 80, and there are some questions. Uh, yeah. One from Martin to start with. Do we need similar considerations for children water systems as for heating? Um, yes, Martin, we certainly do. Chilled water is, uh, um, has a higher level of dissolved oxygen in um, its, uh, its constituent fluid properties. So yes, corrosion control in chilled water is exactly 
the same as the heating circuits that we've just been predominantly talking about. I know that the standards we're talking about uh, corrosion control in, in heating and chilled water circuits. So yes, well, uh, good question and probably one that I should have picked up in the presentation. But just, just on that topic, there is a limitation to the, the utilisation of the ECM, the electronic coupon method. It has a kind of pressure rating of about six and a half bar and a maximum temperature of 95 degrees Celsius and a minimum temperature of 5 degrees Celsius. So it does generally cover that broad brush range, but it may not cover every application. We have clients that have utilised the devices in open uh, systems that have maybe been treated because they want to actually, again, measure the rate of corrosion in that process. But just be aware that that might expire the, the probe quicker than you would have in uh, a normal standard um, uh, closed sealed system effectively. Thanks for the question, Martin. Suresh has also put a question. Can you advise if certain pressure levels enhance cor corrosion rates for the examples which you have provided? Yeah, your your as I mentioned earlier on, your your pressure rate is is about six and a half bar. And effectively, what you can do in in systems that are higher uh, in 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 uh, neutral pressure point at the base of the building, if we're going at the high rise building effectively, you can basically move the, the, the probes and the monitors around the system until you get underneath that pressure status. Um, with regards to the corrosion rates that we talked about with the average yearly corrosion rates, they are um, the, the mean average for a period of time. So if, if, if they're well beneath seven, um, and as we showed you, there's a number of worked examples that we showed that were at 1.9 for four years of operation or or two for four, uh, three, four years of operation. Um, these kind of levels are achievable as long as we're not having constant makeup into the system, as long as we're not discharging water from these closed sealed systems. The point I made in the earlier presentation, uh, don't discharge that water. If that water has been in there, um, and is not um, harming the system. Why would you be discharging it? Um, it's not. It's not sustainable. It's not environmentally friendly, particularly if you've got chemical in that process, because you need to tank that away from the site. You need to bring in a in a tanked vehicle and remove it and take it to a correctly uh, SEPA and Scottish Environmental Protection Agency or or the the, the UK Environmental Protection Agency to do so. Um, there's there's anecdotal evidence that there's large volumes of chemical that's going into the Thames um, that needs to be stopped um, from an environmental process. So I don't know if that answers that question um, yeah. as well as the candidate would wish, but uh, any more that they can email me back on that. Yeah, question from Richard. Any recommendations for lab testing companies for corrosion within pipework? Um, yeah, you know, lab test results from a fluid sample. Um, do it as quickly as you possibly can is my best advice. Um, if you can do it live on site and there are devices that you can achieve that, I certainly would recommend that that is done with pH in a system because the longer the pH is, is retained in a sample reservoir or whatever and, and presented to the lab, that, that duration pro process is, 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 is long and by long I mean hours or days or, or weeks or whatever. Um, then the results can be pretty spurious to a certain extent. Um, I certainly wouldn't be measuring dissolved oxygen as I had a conversation with one particular organisation who suggested they were measuring dissolved oxygen back at the lab. There is no point in measuring dissolved oxygen back at a lab because the temperature and pressure of the fluid in your system has changed to what you're presenting it to in the lab. The minute you take the fluid from a sealed system and take it into the environment, you will change the properties of that fluid. Um, so there's there's aspects of the of testing that's done within the, the the lab process that I'm not terribly comfortable with taking as a benchmark for uh, corrosion protection um, in in some of the, the the processes and utilizing a risk course sometimes will 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 highlight some of the issues that are not being attended to in that process at the moment. But I'd want a lot of the organisations that are in that marketplace to improve their understanding of pressurisation greatly so that they can understand the, 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 the data that comes out of these devices. Thanks, Gordon. Question from Mark, where can corrosion monitors be obtained and where is best to cite them? And I suppose ancillary to that is, is it different for heating and chilled water systems? 
Um, devices are not different. The devices are um, the same in both instances. Um, I kind of knew you were going to ask that question, so I did prepare a slide. Um, so locations, uh, Gordon, the locations yeah. of them in each so, system. So where to locate them? Um, effectively, what we can do, the best thing to do is get a schematic. But as I mentioned on one of the slides earlier on, shunt return and index flushing circuits at the end of your CT and VT circuits on a heating system or on your chilled water circum, uh, system, the furthest most point from location. Once you achieve that, you're going to have optimal corrosion uh, locations and devices to overlay on a system. So again, we will, uh, if you email us, we will indicate as to where they go. With regards to where the units can be procured, they can be procured from, from ourselves directly through HASL. They can be purchased through uh, some of the merchant chains. They don't have a stock holding of these devices. There's various firmware and software applications that can come on the devices. And there are OEM partners who basically um, uh, procure the items and sell the items themselves. So um, if you need any more evidence with that, if you perhaps email me at the end of the process, we can deal directly with you through one of our um, distribution partners. Great, thanks, Gordon. Question from Steve. First of all, he said thanks for the presentation, Gordon. Sorry. He's also a VDI fan as well. And he said, can we retrofit the coupon sensors into an old closed system that had been historically uh, treated? And how long does a probe coupon last? <laughs> Great question. Often get it. Um, yes, you can retrofit it. Uh, we're, we're doing a lot of uh, work with clients that want to have visibility of the corrosion activity in an existing system. With regards to rectification, what I, to what I say there is I wouldn't rectify a system until I knew what the corrosion rates were. Um, I, I, we want to deliver a level of people's understanding of what the system is actually doing at the moment. So if you have a system, and we discussed this with a client again today, where they basically said this is an old system and we, we've been looking at the pipework to see if we need to replace it. Well, don't discharge a lot of water. Find out what your average yearly corrosion rate on a seven hour basis. If it's really flat lined, if it's, a, if it's not high at all, You've got a bit of comfort. You've got quite a bit of confidence that that system's not in a highly corrosive state. So if you've not got penetrations in the pipework, then I would just continue with that process and monitor for corrosion. If you want to put a minimal form of remediation in there, you can do so. What we tend to say to any clients um, is that when you're introducing to an existing system, make sure that we do that in between two isolation valves and minimise water losses we're introducing in consideration to the schematic locations that we identify and recommend. Um, how long can a uh, probe last? Well, that depends upon the rate of corrosion that it's exposed to. The probe is 54 microns thick. The probe is the thickness of a human hair. Now, you might be alarmed at that. You shouldn't be alarmed at that because the evidence that we've shown you is that some of the systems have extremely low levels of corrosion. Um, so you don't need thick pieces of, of metal to measure for that corrosion process. The Harvester's Way example that I showed you, that still has 95% of its coupon left and it's been in there for four years on 183 Maisonettes, townhouses and flats. The probe, a replacement probe, is not an expensive item. Um, it, it's, it's in the hundreds of pounds, in the small hundreds of pounds. Um, replacing probes is not a major issue. Um, but finding out your average yearly corrosion is more effective for any, anything else. Question from Tony. Side stream filtration units require back flushing periodically. This results in the introduction of raw water every couple of weeks or so. Any thoughts? Introduction of raw water in a couple of weeks processing uh, as a percentage of the system content is a bad idea. Introduction of raw water in a constant basis is a bad idea. Um, so minimise as best you possibly can, and 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 back flush. Um, when we're back flushing a side stream filtration unit, we're back flushing it for a reason. And the debris and the 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 the, the, co the content, we need to understand why that's happening. We need to make sure that if we are back flushing it, we're not going to be back flushing it at the same regularity as we've been doing for a long time. Because as I've said, you know, raw water into that system will 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 cause all sorts of issues, um, particularly if it's too frequent. 
Um, th there's a term in VDI 2035, and I know that one of your callers is a big fan, so I'm going to use it. Regardless of whether we're using VDI 2035 or whether we're using our standard guidance with regards to inhibi inhibition and the use of inhibitors, we need to minimise water replenishment in our sealed systems. The VDI 2035 states that we should only, after first fill, use twice the system content in the lifetime of the system. And their lifetime means about 30 years. Have a think about that out there. Sometimes we're using twice the replenishment of the water within the first year before we get to practical completion. From an environmental and a sustainable point of view, that is not acceptable, in my opinion. Question from uh, Rob. Um, can it be used on brine loops with ground source heat pumps? Um, hmm. <laughs> uh, we have. I'm not sure we've used it on a brine loop from a ground source heat pump before. I I'm not conscious that I've used it in that application, uh, and I would probably need to check with uh, technical back. I don't know if Rob is Rob Visors is actually available there, and I don't know whether Rob has a comment to that. That you've maybe stumped me on that one, Rob. Um, no, I don't. I don't think because there's lots of oxygen. You know, it's an open system. You know, so um, that's not something where we would recommend it. I mean, I, I, again, I, I mentioned in the presentation, if it's in a, if it's on an open loop system, or if it's, you know, you, you, the level of um, uh, oxygen in that system is going to be immense. So the rate of of degradation of the coupon is going to be very, very quick. Um, you know, if it, for example, if it runs at two hundred micron meters every every seven hours. Um, and we've only got 50 microns on the end of the tip. We're going to go through it in about three months. So it, it's it's going to be, it's a costly process for you to process, to utilise in that uh, in that application. However, in that application, you're probably using some form of chemical to inhibit the process of corrosion damage to the circuit. So the Risicor could be a means of validating the efficiency of that inhibition process um I, i'd probably want rob to email me independently on that and we'll do a wee bit more research about that particular application i, I suppose yeah also uh, the question follows as well gordon it can be used with glycol where there's glycol yeah, 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 yeah. yep 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 there's no i mean effectively within that, that process there's there's yeah. there's the, there's no necessary reason why that would be uh why that yeah. would it be impaired yeah, um, question from Terry, which is better, vacuum degasser, air or dirt separator or side stream filtration for chilled water systems? Um, I'm biased. I'm a, I'm a Spiratech distributor. Um, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of vacuum degassing. Um, the vacuum degassing with the combination of makeup in the same product, I think is a bit of a no-brainer on a larger de development because you're doing away with a makeup unit that might just be putting fresh water, raw water into your system, which by definition we've, we've discussed is damaging to your system. So if we can vacuum degas that water when we're making up, then that's got to be an advantage to the process. We've just recently done a case study with one of the piping manufacturers in a particular project, and that equipment has been selected by ourselves, and the process and pressurisation is, is, is done efficiently and effectively, and the, 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 can, the the corrosion levels are are, are 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 superb. Temperature differential deration or air and dirt separators, if selected well within the limitations of their operation, are are very effective. But again, go back to temperature differential deration. We need demand. We need the, we need heating and cooling systems to be operational, um, and we need temperature differential to occur between flow and return of the circuits. The CT. The sorry the uh, the main flow and return to the circuit for that to operate. The vacuum degassers are not temperature dependent, so they don't need operational temperature functionality. They can they can degas um, standard processes. S side stream side stream apparatus um, is is becoming more prevalent because of ease of, of installation. I think more than anything else. Um, but remember, side stream can only really 
clean a very low percentage of your circuit return water um, and takes a lot longer to do that process. And as one of your callers or one of your um, uh, delegates mentioned, um, we still have to back flush through that process. We may be using the system operational pumps to pull that the, 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 that uh, water through these devices. Um, I'm probably not best best trained in the, the side stream aspect, but we're certainly seeing more potential application of that process. And like any of these systems, we are desperate for most of these manufacturers to adopt some form of, of independent verification and systematic monitoring of the effectiveness of the devices. And certainly a lot of our clients are doing exactly that. Thanks. Thanks, Gordon. We've had another question on the brine uh, system, so uh, that's something maybe to consider uh, at another time. Um, sure. Do the corrosion probes ever lose material due to erosion by high velocity water flow than that contains particulate matter? Um, not that I'm aware of. I've never, I've certainly never came across anything that would uh, cause degradation of the of the tip of the probe. The probe is effectively um, up to uh, five millimeters in the internal diameter of the system pipework, so there shouldn't be any potential damage to the process of uh, velocity coming across the face of the, the 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 probe tip. I don't know whether Rob, the visitors, have you got uh, any experience of that uh, aspect? No, I've never really come across that. Um, also, they're usually installed in the straight part of the pipe and not in bends. So that's not a problem that we're aware of. Great. I mean, generally, generally the flow velocities in these pipe headers on the low loss headers generally about 1.5 meters a second or up to three meters a second. So unless we're looking at a particularly high velocity uh, circuit, again, if the candidate, if the delegate wants to email me directly at the end of the presentation, that would be better. And you shouldn't really have that much dirt in the system that you get erosion, you know, it's uh, yeah, water should be clean. Great, thanks. Um, I've had a few email questions too. One is, how do you retrieve the information? Is there a direct connection to a BMS or is it over the cloud or? Yeah, so interoperability, um, easy for me to say at this time of night. Right. So it, every unit has a vote free contact alarm to the BMS head end. So every seven hours when we deliver the, the rate of corrosion, if it's above the threshold of 24 micron meters, we will send an alarm. And one alarm is only a warning. A continuous alarm, we would recommend that you get off your backside and have a look at that system because you should not be expecting that from a sealed system. The data that's held on the logger, which sits on top of the probe, which is part of the assembly, um, that is presented through our, PC, our free PC dashboard software as a CSV file, and it's availed um, via the PC dashboard or via another product um, called the Risicom Historical Product, an SD card reading device. Alternatively, and as an optional unit, a CXI, a cloud-based unit, which avails everything that I've just talked about, plus it has an RJ45 connection which gets connected to a router, um, provided by others in the plant room, um, which can be mapped from our cloud-based application, which again I showed you in the earlier presentation, and can be taken to a third-party piece of software. Um, when you're mapping through that API, that application protocol interface, we would recommend you have a conversation with us so that we can hold your hand through that process. Um, and in addition to that, on the CSV file that you get, the interval temperature on our units will demonstrate good hydraulic control and energy efficiency of the circuit. Because we 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 have very rare occurrence, but we have occasional um, demonstrations of poor hydraulic control, where our temperature, because of the way that we measure that that process and the corrosion rate, it triggers a different alarm error. But you see that on the CSV code, and it basically tells you that you've got unstable temperatures coming back and highly fluctuating temperatures coming back on that return. It's basically highlighting short circuiting um, in your hydraulics, um, and that can be a significant benefit to the process. So um, that's the kind of process of, of uh, taking the data back. So um, a couple of different processes, but just as just as well I created that for this presentation tonight. 
Great, great. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, uh, what about medium temperature hot water systems? Can it be? 95 degrees Celsius is our uh, maximum, but remember that we said it's on the return. Yeah. But I would be very hesitant to stick it on a 120, 90 system uh, because I would want them to guarantee that that was never coming back at that level. But sometimes we basically, uh, I know that historically some of the vacuum degassing equipment that we've put on these systems, we sometimes put a kind of buffer vessel in between so that we can ensure that the temperature is not going to get down to that level. The problem with that is sometimes we're not actually measuring. We're not, we're not, um, uh, we're not on a circuit that is necessarily the full system return. So if they have applications of that uh, type, let's have a conversation with them directly. Does the unit come in one size or all, are there different sizes of... Uh... No, nope. the, the, the units the units effectively, the, the vast majority of the units uh, go in in the sense that the, the, the units described here uh, and, and visible here, that's just going in through a half inch pocket on the on the pipework and um, either on the top or on the side depend upon the leds that are at the head of the system we really want to see them so if it's at high level we probably would want it on the side uh, if the pipework was at high level because if it was facing the concrete we wouldn't be able to see it uh, the concrete slab um, so it goes in through a half inch pocket no more than 25 millimeters deep so if it's on an existing pocket if you were retrofitting it from a temperature probe or a pressure probe, we would recommend that you actually you chop that down to 25 mil before you put our probe retaining um, holder into the system, and then the probe goes in to give you hydraulic separation, uh, and then you basically clip the logger on the head. There is a there is a smaller unit, the CBU Zero Fix, which is a Bolifix valve with a CBU um, different type of head that's incorporated into the valve. It can't be used on temperatures that are beneath the dew point, so we tend not to use that on chilled water circuits. Um, it is a very cost-effective unit. It's a very, uh, a, uh, it's only a couple of hundred pounds effectively. At that unit um, gives you all the data, but it doesn't give you gives you all the BMS, gives you the localized data retrieval, uh, all the stuff we talked about. But it's it's not got cloud connectivity. Um, but that's that that's handy for optimizing secondary circuit. Uh, monitoring points at smaller bore pipework levels. This, you know, as, as you go up the building, the, the pipework can get smaller and smaller and smaller, and you just simply use that as a substitute for an isolation valve. It's quite a, that's generally the process that we use that for. Great. A uh, comment from Steve. Thanks for the slide on interoperability, and he's very keen on cloud-based data remote systems and dashboard information being readily available. Yeah, so I mean, as I mentioned, there's a there's a separate what we call TTs, tips and tricks sheets that we can send to the, the that to Steve, um, that tells them that that we simply sit with them and map that data back to the process. Um, in addition, I don't know if many of your delegates are using IES, but IES have have worked with us in the past pre pre COVID. Um, and they were utilising the CSV file data as part of their iScan process. So their iScan process is all about um, data points from around the built asset um, structure uh, and, and and providing it on one platform. So there's numerous different providers that are desperate for more and more data coming from devices. Um, it's it's pretty straightforward Microsoft Azure um, platform cloud software that we utilize so we can we can basically map that to anybody's third party processes. There's there can be an element of charge uh, in year two and year three. It's not been defined under the CXI, but it, it, it maybe it's a minimal charge for the data consumption, but it's not really applicable so much to the CXI. It's more applicable to the the soft launched PCXI that I, I very, very, I just touched on very lightly earlier on. We've got a bit of a uh, chip issue on the production of that unit, hence the reason why we've just uh, dampened it down its marketing activity. But um, that that consumes more data on the cloud. So, a bit more of that with Steve when he communicates directly with us. Great, great. That that seems like the, the last question. Um, if you could send a copy of that presentation to me and your technical handbook, which people are asking for. Yeah. Um, we've also got another question before we finish, maybe the last question of the evening, because we'll, we'll shut off at eight. But sure. real-time monitoring is a bit like the 
powerful event lock in modern cars referenced in warranties. Perhaps insurers of contracts of buildings owners might be interested in this, considering the cost of replacing the whole system due to corrosion after occupation. Uh, more of a statement that I would yeah. con concur with. But um, yes, I think suffice to say that some of our bigger clients are the managing agents of some of the biggest buildings in, in, in our major city centres and our local authorities and our universities and our uh, prison authorities, education authorities. All these comp uh, institutions are concerned about operational expenditure of their built assets and their, you know, as we said, greater due diligence and great, greater uh, internet of things is going to become mildly disruptive or even significantly disruptive to industries that are not recognising the data that's coming from these devices. Um, and it then puts question on their abilities to deal with the data that comes out of these devices. But um, there's some big hitters in technology that are getting involved in building services now and they're taking an interest in it for a given reason because they see that um, greater transparency is result that's required in the process. But uh, yeah, thanks for the comment. I think I would agree with it and concur with yeah, it. That was Chris. A lot of Chris. Thanks, Gordon. Not thanks, at all, Stephen. Bob. Thank you very much for that. Just, just and, on that. Uh, final thing was that I was going to say that I did flash up on the screen. Do, if the region has its own charity, um, I'd be delighted to support it. But in the absence yeah. of that, we would suggest um, that we support Crash. Um, I think you mentioned that we maybe got up to 80 or whatever our final number was yes. in attendance. I would effectively suggest that we'll give £2 for every attendee tonight to the charity or either of your choice or to Crash. But we can have a conversation about that, Stephen. We can have a conversation about that. That's great. Thank you, Colin. Very kind. And uh, thank you to Rob all the way from Germany. My pleasure. Thanks <laughs> OK. <laughs> Indeed. Great. Thanks, Rob, for your support. Okay. And thanks to yeah. Ella. Thanks. And there's com and the uh, just you. compliments. Very absorbent. Thank you. Uh, I remember coupons and also temporary strainer cones as well. So we've oh, got well. about 30 seconds left. Thanks. Fantastic. Go well, on. thanks again. Have a good evening. Day.